afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you here. It's our first Sunday for 2013. And I want to talk a little bit more about holiness and righteousness. And um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to come around your word. We pray for your guidance, your direction. We pray you lead us in everything we do. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to talk about holiness and righteousness. Referring to some a question that someone asked me about body piercing and tattoos. Okay? Now, when we go into the Psalms, and I'd like to read this first of all from Psalm 29. In Psalm 29, verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. Now, that scripture is talking about being holy and worshipping God from that holiness. It's not talking about worshipping God through your abilities. It's not talking about worshipping God through the way you look or the way you dress. It's talking about worshipping God in holiness. Now we know the scripture that God says, Be holy, for I am holy. And we know that God is speaking to us to be a holy nation of people. But people today in the church are occupied with the way they look. And the way they present themselves. Now maybe some people want to lose weight. I don't see anything wrong with that. I've lost weight myself. But the reason that I've lost weight is not that I've become more handsome or, or, or more anything. It's because I want to last longer in ministry. I want to walk the roads, the highways and byways to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why is it that the church is so paranoid about the way they look? individuals in the church why are they so concerned with outward appearance i believe the major reason they're not they're not happy with themselves i can look in the mirror and say to myself well hey, i like that man i like that new christian guy now i wrote a book called who am i and the reason i wrote that book is so to explain to people that we need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Because it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And that we need to know that we are also in Christ Jesus. That when the Father looks at my heart, he doesn't see my heart, he sees Jesus. When the Father looks at the outside of me, he sees Jesus. So therefore, to know who we are is an important thing. Today in the church, we find that so many young people are losing their identity. They don't know who they are, or in the world, I should say. And people in the church also, young people in the church, they don't know who they are. I think churches need to teach the new creation message. Old things passed away, behold, all things are new. Now that means the old life has changed. We're still in the world, but we're not of the world. We are the church. We are separated and sanctified by the blood of Jesus to do a holy work of righteousness throughout the nations. That's his command. It's not a request. It's not an invitation. It's a command. Be holy. Now what happens is some people decide that they, they don't want to follow that, but they want everything the church has to offer. Safety maybe. They go to a church and maybe they find a boyfriend. They go to a church and maybe they find a girlfriend. Someone who has a, a, a reasonably good moral life. But today in the church, the morality is falling. I went to a church the other day in another city and they asked me to preach. Of course, I'm preaching on holiness and righteousness. I come in and the girls are standing up there leading. Have one girl has such a short dress that the, the skirt was maybe one inch from her bum. She couldn't sit down and she couldn't bend over because you'd see what she's wearing underneath. 
The other girl had a low top and very large breasts. Now what was their purpose? They were up there singing the songs. And I'm about to preach about holiness and righteousness. Are they performing to glorify Christ or glorify themselves? They may try to justify themselves, but it was minus six degrees. Everyone else is rubbed up in coats, hats and scarves. And here are these two done up like a Christmas tree. What's the purpose? I can tell you this. It was not to glorify Jesus Christ. It was trying to attract some males. And males operate on a visual thing. Now when we, we read that scripture, we are to, to worship God in holiness. It's a wonderful place to be. Lost in that place of, 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 with, of being with God and and, and knowing His manifest presence. People want the manifest presence of God, but they're not prepared to manifest as sons and daughters of God. Manifest as sons and daughters of God, it means show yourself as sons and daughters of God. Not all of the world, but as sons and daughters of God. Is that about your appearance? Yes, partly. Do you have to be dressed up like a model? Do you have to wear makeup so thick that people cannot see you? Do you have to wear tattoos all over your face? Do you have to have your body pierced in your nose, your eyes, your lips, your ears, <coughs> your tongue, have your tongue split? Do you have to have all of those things to show yourselves as sons and daughters of God? God forbid. No. Because here it's saying in that psalm that beauty is in the holiness of worshipping God in holiness. I say to the young people who come to the Lord, don't worry about your beauty. Focus in on the relationship with Jesus and you will become more beautiful and more handsome just by your relationship with Jesus. We can read about Jesus in Isaiah in chapter 53 and verse 2. And it says in Isaiah chapter 3 and and verse 2, that Jesus did not look beautiful. It says that Jesus had an appearance which was not desired by others. Maybe Jesus had a big nose. Maybe he had a short curly black beard. Maybe he had a long beard. Maybe he had a big forehead like me. Maybe he was fat. He loved drinking wine. The Bible says he was a wine bibbler. He enjoyed his food. But was he handsome? No. The TV, the movies, tried to make him out to be handsome. People draw pictures of him as this beautiful angelic face. But in actual fact, the Bible says he was not that way. But what was the thing that caused so many people to come to him? What was the beauty that he had? See, because beauty does attract. Beauty does attract. Flowers, you see a flower, you want to go and smell it because it's beautiful. Now the beauty that Jesus had was the holiness of God. That when he opened his mouth, it may not have been words of eloquence that everyone heard. He may, not, he may have had a speech problem, who knows? But what did people hear? People heard the spirit of the man. And they heard that, that words that brought conviction. Jesus had 12 disciples. They followed him. They dropped their nets. They left their homes. They just followed him. They fell in love with him. He then he had 70. Then he had 500. Then he had 3,000, 5,000. All the time there were many, many people around him. But he was not desirable as in the physical. But people desired him because of the beauty that lay within him. And people don't understand that holiness and righteousness is the beginning of our beauty. 
It is where beauty stems from, our heart. Where is our heart towards God? People say to me they're Christians, and the next minute they're doing things, and I say, well, I can't see that as being Christian. Why? Because they're not reading their word. We have an obligation as pastors and teachers to tell people the word of God. That obligation is so that the next generation, their faith can grow, because faith comes by hearing and by hearing of the word. And we need to explain to people that, that, that there is teaching and there is understanding about different topics. Why is it that when I go to New Zealand, I see many Christians with tattoos on their arms and on their legs? Why do I see people with pierced noses and pierced lips and pierced ears in the church? What's the reason? To understand that, we need to look at the history of where they are and what goes behind it. Some people say it's cultural. They say the Maori people put it all on their face. Well, there's different reasons for that. One reason is for war, to make them look fierce against their enemy. The other is the story of one of their princes going into the underworld. But we are not children of the underworld. We are children of the light. So what has the underworld got to do with us? So why would people want to disfigure their body with tattoos? and piercing up the body, splitting the tongues, and so on. Because they haven't realized who they are in Christ Jesus. They don't know who they are, because they haven't been taught about who they are. We are chosen children of God. And unless the scriptures are opened up... See, Jesus said to the devil, when the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, when it says every word of God, it means every word of God. The Bible has two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. Do we throw away a part of it because we disagree with it? Because in the New Testament, we come under grace. In the Old Testament, it has become under law. But has the law done away with Jesus has come and brought grace. But the Old Testament is the teacher. It needs us, we need to read it and know it because it helps us to know what happens under grace. The Israelites constantly fell into tr trouble with rebellion. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 1 to 5, we see that the, the nation of Israel goes into rebellion when Moses goes to talk with God. Leviticus chapter 19, let's go to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. Leviticus chapter 19. Because I got asked a question, I've been asked this question several times, and I've just given people an answer, but now I need to explain it a little bit more in Scripture. If God says to you in the commandments, <coughs> thou shalt not kill, does that mean that under grace we're allowed to kill people today? You understand me? If God says thou shalt not kill people, kill someone in the Old Testament, does that mean under grace we're allowed to kill people because we're covered by grace? God forbid we are not. But an Old Testament commandment still is applicable today. People talk, talk, oh, well, what about slavery and all this thing? We don't have slavery today. Well, they're living in a, in a bubble. If they were living in China or Africa, they would know that slavery is worse today than ever in the history of mankind. But people in the West have this idea that everything is the way it's in their country, it's everywhere else. It's not. But their countries are going down. Now look, listen to this in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 28. It's a simple, simple paragraph, uh, verse. You shall not make cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord your God. That is, that is a direct command from God. Now, some people today say, oh, it's body art. 
Well, it's this and it's that. Well, that's idolatry. The reason it's idolatry is not that people worship that tattoo. It is because they are making themselves to be God and say, I'm not happy the way my body is. Therefore, I'm going to put holes in my body and change the design. I'm going to put pictures on my body and change the design. Now, who is the designer? God. So when we decide to change the design, are we not coming into conflict with God? Yes, we are. Now, someone might say, well, what about plastic surgery? Well, plastic surgery is good. Because there have been many cases of people who have had disfigurements and problems, and they've been able to have plastic surgery after war or battles and been able to be repaired. But how far do you go with the plastic surgery? One woman in China, she was not the most beautiful woman. She went to the doctors and said, I want some plastic surgery so I can get a husband. She got all this plastic surgery done, spent lots of money, got a husband and got married. They had a baby, and a couple of years later the baby didn't look like the mother, didn't look like the father, and the father accused the woman of having a relationship with another man. Because this baby doesn't look like the mother, it doesn't look like the father. But in actual fact she looked like what the mother looked like before. She never told her husband she had plastic surgery. She went into deception. Now, did she have a right to have the plastic surgery? Well, that's up to her. But she cut her body and changed the body to deceive. Deception. And once you start into deception, you are entering into the kingdom of darkness. When you study demonology in our Bible college, You'll see that taking drugs and inserting needles in your body is also in the realm of demonology. Now, pharmacia is, is taking drugs. Now, you're piercing your body with a needle. You are actually cutting your body. Originally, tattoos were done with cuts in the body and putting it in, putting in the dye. Now, they've refined it to needles. Now, many of the people were cutting themselves when someone died in their family. Now, God had warned the Israelites not to do that. So here we see in Leviticus, there is a command. It says, don't become like the world. And he sort of says, well, uh, today's modern, it's modern art. Well, when I was a little boy, I used to write with an ink pen in an inkwell in the desk. Today, everybody is using uh, ballpoint pens. Maybe some people still in China are using fountain pens. But we'd have a piece of paper there called blotting paper. So when we made a mistake, we could blot the ink and suck it up. But that blotting paper had blue blotches all over it. I have known people who got tattoos 50 years ago. And today, their tattoos look like blotting paper. They've lost the color. They've lost the definition. They've lost the shape. They look absolutely ugly. See, the body will try to restore the skin to the way the Creator made it. And it will be fighting against that. What's, what's the disadvantages of tattoos and getting your body pierced? Is that you can get infections. You can get diseases. And people go into these little tattoo places in people's backyards and have these tattoos done. Who knows what the cleanliness of that place is like? And people sometimes have got AIDS from getting tattoos. We are children of the light, not in the darkness. We are created in God's image and His likeness. We need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, does that mean that a doctor can't use a mark on your body when you need to have uh, chemotherapy? Of course he can. It would be ridiculous to think, that they have to remark a person every time. But once they pinpoint the, the place, they can put that mark. But it's not done in a way to glorify the flesh. As my dear sister said, 
what would it look like when you wear a wedding dress if you've got the tattoos? It's not going to look so good. Now you can quote Romans chapter 10, verse 4. And you could quote Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 and 35. And Ephesians 2, 15. Because in those three scriptures it says that Christ is our righteousness. That the law is a teacher. That Christ brings us to a place of reconciliation. I'm not condemning people who already have these things done. I'm saying that Christians need to ask the questions. Why would they want to do that now? Are they going to glorify God in what they do? And some will say, oh, I'm going to get a cross put on my body. Well, why don't you go all the way and put a big eagle on your body? But maybe your chest is not big enough for the eagle. And maybe the wings will wrap around your back. But why don't you go all the way? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And someone needs to tell the church and tell the young people that this type of behavior is going back and connected to foreign gods and foreign religions. In Isaiah chapter 15, verse 2, it says the Israelites learned these things from the other nations of cutting hair and cutting their bodies. They learn these type of things. Now, if they learn them, faith comes by hearing and by hearing of the Word. We need to teach people by teaching the Word of God. But if the Israelites are warned about going into other cultures and, and, and adopting those things, then we have to take a warning too. Do you know the saying, in, while in Rome, do as the Romans do? Well, that's a lot of rubbish. You do not do that as a Christian. You do not become like the world. You're in the world as a righteous vessel to impact the world with the message of Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 6, Jeremiah also mentions about how they cut themselves. The, these different people and the priests cut themselves. And in Jeremiah 41.5, it also talks about them cutting themselves. I have seen videos of, of Hindus and Muslims in a dance, in a trance, so mesmerized in their trance that they have taken swords and cut their back open, pushed the sword through their chest here and out their arm with no blood. Demonic. It is demonic. It's piercing their body. It's mutilation. Any tattoo is a mutilation of the body. Any body piercing is also a mutilation of the body. Because we are saying to God, Hey God, you're not right. And I'm my God, and I'll make my own decision. Now I know lots of people will listen to this, watch this on YouTube, and disagree with me. Well, they've got to disagree with the Word of God, not in trial. Because God has said already in Leviticus, don't cut your body. Don't tattoo your body. And we come under grace. And people quote the grace scriptures. And, and in Romans chapter 14 verse 23 it says, If it is not done by faith, then it is done for the wrong reasons. Do you get a tattoo by faith? Is God asking you to get a tattoo? Here, what's some of the disadvantages? Can you imagine a, a beautiful girl going for a job in a big, big company to sit on the front desk and meet all the clients coming in the door? And across her forehead, she's got the word love tattooed on her forehead. Another girl comes in who doesn't have the word tattooed love. Do you, who's going to get the job? There's a disadvantage to having tattoos. And I'm not saying I judge people, but if people come with the tattoos, maybe some people are prejudiced. Some people will not employ them. 
That's just the practical things. I'm talking about a spiritual thing. I'm saying that tattoos, body piercing, is an indication of a much deeper, seated problem in the makeup of that person, in their relationship with God, because they don't know who they are. They're still trying to find identity. They're still trying to create an identity. I read lots of things on Facebook. I understand what lots of young Chinese people, uh, Christian people are saying all around the world. Maybe the promiscuousness of dress is an issue. How can we have revival in the churches if we don't have holiness and righteousness in our heart? If we don't have a desire to be holy and righteous, how can we impact other people? We cannot. Because you will not evangelize intellectually people to Christ. You will evangelize people spiritually when you speak to their spirit. Now when people become saved and they've had tattoos and all that sort of thing, of course it's put under the blood of God. God forgives sin and all that sort of thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, when we become a Christian, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We become God's temple. Now, do we have certain responsibilities with God's temple? I believe so. Now, it doesn't say in the Bible, thou shalt not smoke. It also says in the Bible, you can have some drink. But the problem is that when people take the things to extreme, they cause sickness to their body. Alcoholism, nicotine leading to cancer, passive cancer, the families that are sucking in the smoke from the people smoking, they're not looking after their body. Christians that say they're Christians and smoking, I think that there is a deep-seated problem. Maybe it is also a possibility of deliverance. But I also think that with tattoos and, and body piercing. Any lacerations of the body to change the appearance, you have to question, where is that person really spiritually? I see some people who come into church and they love the Lord. And they just absolutely get lost in God. Yeah, maybe they wear a little bit of makeup. Maybe they wear pierced earrings. Girls I'm talking about. Or maybe boys wear some makeup too, I don't know. Just today. We need to understand that how we look will give an impression. How we have church will give an impression. How we behave in church will give an impression. The unconverted that comes in, they're not looking for someone who's the same as them. They're looking for hope. They're looking for a light. They're looking for a chance to change. And they're looking for something. But the church is trying to be like the world. And that's a problem. See, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 21 to 23, there is a verse there that says, Do not even give the appearance of sin. Now, if we give the appearance of sin, whether our clothes are too short or too low, or provocative, whether we've got tattoos or body piercing, it gives an impression of something else. Now you might say I'm being judgmental. Well, I've been into the, the, the darkest places of some prisons in, in, in Australia. I've been into the, into the part where there are murderers in there who have killed seven or eight women. They've done a whole lot of terrible things. Some of them are dying from cancer. Some are in there just dying over the years, just waiting till they die. And most of them have tattoos from the tip of their finger to the top of their heads. It's symptomatic of a problem. It's a symptom of a real deep-seated problem within their, their, their makeup. And, and we need to understand that. How can the church be like that? 
But can they be forgiven? Yes, they can. But what's stopping most people from being forgiven? Do you know? Because they're breaking the greatest commandment of all. That is the, the, the sin of the sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief is the greatest sin we are faced in the world today. But as my teacher said, my teacher said the same thing, Tony Smith. Same as Charles Spurgeon, he said the same thing. The sin of unbelief. But the sin of unbelief comes in two forms. The world is perishing because of unbelief. Because the greatest commandment that God gives us is to, to love Him and to adore Him and to worship Him. But the, the sin of unforgiveness in two parts. One is that when you reject every single word of God, it's because of unbelief. But when you're a Christian and you reject a part of the Word of God, it's still unbelief. Until you are taught. Until you have had the revelation that that Word that, you've just been, that you have been taught is bringing some light onto an issue that maybe you never considered. So unbelief to a believer is just like an apparition. Uh, it just happens once once we learn, we repent, and we move on. And we need to move on. But if we don't move on, our hearts can become hardened. And we can adopt a theology based on a custom or, or a fashion just to change something that was said in the, in the book of Leviticus. We can't do that. We are not to adjust the Word of God to suit the, the fashion. We need to be adjusted by the Word of God to change us. In 2 Corinthians it says, we are the children of the light. Chapter 6, verse 14. We are the children of the light. So what has the darkness got to do with us? Most of the practices I've already said about tattoos and body piercing and laceration come from other religions. But once it becomes, when the, the evil one is going throughout the world and, and portraying this as a fashion, then we have a problem. Because people in the church will start to think, well, it's fashionable. It's like when I, I said to someone here one day, oh, look, your skirt's a bit short. Oh, it's fashionable. I said, it might be fashionable, but it's unacceptable in the house of the Lord. Because we need to be holy and righteous. Fashion sometimes is just betrayed by the media. You look in the media and they, they will Photoshop someone's photo to make them look really skinny or younger and so on. Maybe I should get Photoshopped now. No, not really. I am who I am. I am a child of God, born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, fibre in the Christian, will preach the gospel to anyone who will listen. I have a heart of flesh. I have the Word of God written on my heart. I have the new spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the mind of Christ. And He calls me Son. I know who I am. I don't have to get my significance in a tattoo or body piercing. Or in makeup even. I've had makeup on when they interviewed me for TV. And it changes your appearance. But is it hiding something? A new girl, she had a big red mark on her face. She had a beautiful face, but she had this big red mark. She wore makeup to cover that. I don't see a problem. I don't see a problem with that. I don't think that a little bit of paint is okay, but a lot. It may be hiding something that's even deep, small, deep seated. As I said, we opened up with that, that uh, the psalm. 29, 2. In the beauty of his holiness. You know, Jesus, as I said just before, in Matthew, in Matthew 22, 36, 
which is the greatest commandment. And he, verse, he mentions in, in 37, to love God and obey God. You know, most of the victories in the church can be achieved in the individual's lives and the church by obedience. If you're praising God, knowing that you're obedient to God and to God's word, your prayer list will be very short because you praise Him for everything you have and everything you are, everything you have been, everything you ever will be. He has my yesterdays, He has my todays, and He has my tomorrows. He holds them in His hand. And we should know who we are. This past year, I have spoken at five international conferences, and each time the issue of holiness has come up. And I haven't got it in the book about church evangelism, but I think I'll have to do a chapter and enter it into the book. Because I think that the church needs to understand that if their music has to be holy, their, their people on the platform have to be holy, they have to have an attitude of holiness for what has the church to offer if it doesn't offer that. Because the world is looking for a holy place. We are made in God's image and His likeness. Why should we change it? People will try to manipulate Scripture to justify their position. And I'm, I'm sad to say, it's sad for me to say, that I have seen an increase in the last 15 years or so of tattoos on Christians in the church. And I am amazed that pastors are not teaching about the commandment in Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 28. It is a commandment. Do not do it. Which part of do not do it do people not understand. Now people might disagree with me, but you go to the scripture. There's a contradiction from Old Testament, New Testament, what's in the church today. Where is the contradiction? It's not in God. Because God's already said, don't do it. He said it once, and that's, that should be pretty good. But people today want to change that and say, oh no, he didn't mean that. He said, well, no tattoos and no, no cutting of the body. Maybe you want to get a tattoo. Maybe you want to get your body pierced. And then you'll wrestle with God all night. And you'll wrestle with God on, should I do it, should I not do it? When you wrestle, you might get what you want. But you will walk with a limp. You'll have an imperfection, which will have an impact upon your life. Amen. Amen. So, finally, if you ask my opinion about tattoos, I might say, I have seen some work of arts. But they're better on a canvas than on a person's body. I might say to you, I dislike them. And I don't like them at all. I might say to you, I like them. But I know that God's word says, don't do it. If God's word says, don't do it, my opinion is irrelevant. It is totally irrelevant. God says, don't do it. Don't do it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you for your leading and your guidance. We pray, Lord, that this brings liberty and freedom to people. Father God, and that people will seek your face. And seek you to find out the direction they go in life. And make a good decision based on your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.